and had no energy until Fresh Pet put the puppy back in my dog. The pri Happening now. And previously, if you wanted to be tested for COVID-19, you had to be showing some symptoms. But Metro Health has changed the requirements. Expanded testing and what it means for you. Coming up. San Antonio Parishes will soon reopen. That was the announcement made by Archbishop Gustavo Sierra just before he took to the skies to bless the city. When services begin again. A location at the rim getting pushback for trying to reopen. We talked with the owner about the ordeal. Telemedicine is exploding. More than a billion virtual visits are expected this year. Coming up, we'll look at your options. And I'm keeping a close eye on the radar screen as there is the off chance of some storms tonight. I'll tell you more about that and our better chance of rain in the days ahead. All that coming right up. Plus, see how an agri-science magnet school in the Northeast ISD is taking precautions with its students taking care of animals. The News at 5 starts right now. And first at five, an employee at the Southeast Side Nursing Home, where more than 100 residents and staff members caught COVID-19, has died. It's the first death among staff members at the Southeast Nursing and Rehabilitation Facility on East South Cross since the start of the outbreak back in March. A total of 18 residents have died, but this brings the total number of deaths connected to the facility to 19. The news comes on the same day the White House recommended all residents at more than 15,000 nursing homes across the country all be tested for COVID-19 within the next two weeks. And meanwhile, San Antonio Metro Health expanding COVID-19 testing today to anyone who wants a test. Prior to the announcement, people were being required to show symptoms of the virus in order to be tested. Starting today, that requirement has been lifted and you no longer need to have symptoms. A testing available to people with or without insurance. And there are several drive through testing sites across the city, including at Freeman Coliseum, the Texas Med Clinic on Southwest Military Drive in Zarzamora, and at the Walmart on Loop 410 and Military Drive. We have a link to other testing locations on KSET.com. If you have any questions about this change or the virus, you can always call the COVID-19 hotline. That phone number 210-207-5779. Archbishop Gustavo Garcia Sierra flying over the city this afternoon, celebrating the reopening of parishes next week. Today, the Archbishop teamed up with the Tex Hill Wing of the Commemorative Air Force to announce daily masses in the Archdiocese of San Antonio to resume on May 19th. Weekend masses resuming on the 23rd. Once the parishes reopen, Garcia Sierra says everyone is required to wear a mask to mass and social distancing must be maintained. That means no embracing of any kind, including hugs or handshakes. He instead encourages parishioners to give gestures to show signs of peace. Faith is essential and faith could be lived anywhere. That is the gift of faith. But it's wonderful to know that we'll be able to get together and pray and worship the Lord. After the announcement, Sierra took off in a 1942 SNJ old Yeller jet, or rather Yeller plane, it's not a jet. It flew over 30 locations, including the missions, various churches, and San Antonio City Hall. During the flight, he rang bells and offered blessings before returning to Stinson Airport. Three stories to know today. A 22 year old man killed at a gas station over the weekend has been identified as Joel Ochoa. Police say he was fatally shot early Saturday morning during an altercation at the carry on convenience store on Northwest Loop 410. One person has been arrested. Charges are pending. One of three children who were removed from a home last week after being found living in deplorable conditions in Stockdale has been released from the hospital. We're told the oldest child, just four years old, has been placed in foster care. The one-year-old and two-year-old who were severely malnourished when they were found remain in the hospital. The children were living with their maternal grandmother at the home. The affidavit of removal cites various forms of abuse, including the children being forced to eat feces by a man who once lived at that home. The Wilson County Sheriff's Office is still investigating. So far, no arrests have been made. 
A man recovering this evening after he was severely burned in this house fire last night. It happened just before 10 o'clock at a duplex on East Highland, not too far from Rigsby. Yeah, neighbors told KSAT they heard the sound of an explosion, and when they went to check it out, they saw the house across the street covered in flames. They ended up calling 911, but before firefighters arrived, Maria Gonzalez says her husband and son ran into the fire to help. My husband and my son, they went in there through the back and took out the man. He was in the floor with with burns. Firefighters say a gas leak is what caused this fire. They say the entire gas line needs to be replaced. As for the victim, he is expected to be OK. So exactly what makes a bar? Well, the city confirmed that two neighboring locations at the rim, the Lion and Rose British Restaurant and Pub and the Rustic, were recently told to close down their dining in because they're considered bars, not restaurants. Garrett Berger talked with the owner of the Rustic about their efforts to reopen. Like many San Antonio eateries, the Rustic has been trying to get by with a pickup to go model. But their owner says when they tried to open up their dining area, local authorities said that's a no go. Well, the health department came in a couple days after operations and noticed that we had a red sign in our door. The city determines who's considered a bar based on whether it has a red no handgun sign, which is what's given to locations that take in more than 51% of their gross receipts from alcohol sales. According to online Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission records, that's what both the rustic and neighboring Lion and Rose should have. And unlike restaurants, which are allowed to operate at quarter capacity right now, bars are still closed. The owner of the Rustic tells us the label of bar doesn't quite fit them. We're closer to 40% of our total sales comes from alcohol. So again, we're, we're significantly below that threshold of the 50-50 mark. Noonan said they're cooperating by shutting down the dine me in portion while they try to get either a new license through a TABC or get local authorities to recognize them as a restaurant. Though a city spokeswoman said that depends on how they're registered with TABC. It does become a moot point if the governor says, you know, the end of this week, bars can open at 25%. Um, so, you know, we'll see, but none of us know. In the meantime, the city says delivery and pickup are still acceptable. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. This week, nearly every state started to relax restrictions aimed to stop the spread of the coronavirus. But the ways in which states can reopen is complicated and at times controversial. Karen Cava joins us now live from Washington to explain why. Karen. Yeah, Ursula and Steve, this is when things get a little bit trickier. One state reopening can have a big impact on its neighbors. Welcome to Bristol, the birthplace of country music. This one town sits in two states, Tennessee and Virginia, two places with different schedules to reopen amid the COVID pandemic. You have a restaurant who can look out the window and 30 yards across the street. Uh, there are people walking into businesses, dining, shopping, and so that's a challenge. Some business owners want states like Virginia to open on a regional basis. In Bristol, that would prevent restaurants on the same street from having different restrictions. It's tough because I can see the Tennessee side. I can see them. So if there's a virus over there, it's over here. In South Dakota. Have you traveled to or from an area reported of COVID-19 cases? The Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe feels the state is opening too soon. They set up checkpoints along highways meant to track the virus and stop the spread. No fever, cough, fatigue, shortness of breath? No, don't have any of those things. Okay. South Dakota's governor demands these roadblocks come down, but the tribe refuses. This virus doesn't travel. It's the people with the virus that travel. In Washington, the clash between restarting economies and protecting health is on full display as President Trump presses more states to reopen. Top members of the administration's task force have gone into some form of quarantine, including the heads of the CDC, FDA, and the nation's top infectious disease specialist, Anthony Fauci. Now, staff is conducting contact tracing to determine how coronavirus got inside the White House. And there are also a new rules in place for White House staffers. Those going in the West Wing have to wear a face covering and visitors will now be limited. But President Trump in a briefing just a short while ago said things there on the White House grounds are under control. Stephen Ursula. And Karen, a lot of Americans are wondering when more relief aid may be on the way, whether it's for unemployed workers or struggling small businesses. What's the latest from Capitol Hill on another possible stimulus? 
Yeah, well, Steve, House Democrats want to go full steam ahead on this, and they want to go big, perhaps on par with that $2.2 trillion spending package they passed at the end of March, or even bigger. The priorities there would be more of those stimulus payments to Americans, also some money for mail-in voting as the general election approaches, and of course, money for state and local governments that have had to pay out a lot in during the coronavirus crisis. But the White House and Senate Republicans are signaling some resistance there over the weekend, a number of White House economic advisors were out on the Sunday show saying, let's wait and see what those first spending bills, almost $3 trillion worth, do before we sign off on more, Steve. Karen Kafa live in Washington. Thank you, Karen. And if you haven't received your stimulus check yet, there's a deadline coming up to get it via direct deposit. Wednesday, the last day to submit your bank account information to the IRS. After that, you're going to have to wait for a paper check. That could take weeks. We have information on how to submit that information right now on ksat.com. Back here at home, schools remaining closed because of COVID-19 concerns, but students at an agri-science magnet school are still having to feed and raise several animals. With social distancing in place, the school has had to take some necessary precautions. Madison High School has been recognized as one of the state's best agri-science programs, so it's got to keep going. It set up a seven-day schedule for its students. Only five students at a time can enter their huge barn in order to stay at least six feet apart for social distancing. Making sure that we have plenty of space based on the square footage of the facility where students could move freely without uh, coming across each other's paths. It Stewart says students also must wear rat masks as well as disinfect any tools they're sharing. And the school is welcoming parents to help supervise as well. Coming up at six, a student talks about meeting her responsibilities in this time of crisis. And here's a live look outside with our live cam. A nice mixture of clouds in the sky. We have the low level puffy cumulus clouds and even some higher level clouds streaming overhead all at once. It looks good out there, but you will be noticing the increase in humidity. And also we could use some rain. So we'll be talking about those rain chances in a moment. 84, that was our high temperature today. That's our current reading at the airport after a low of 60 degrees. And right now weather watchers, for the most part, 80s, but still some 70s in the hill country. Lakey 78, 79 West Kerrville, and even Holotus at 79 degrees. So not overly warm or hot out there today. Actually, many locations right around average. But we will see a little increase in rain chances in the days ahead, which we could really use. And I'm going to talk more about that coming right up. Thank you, Adam. Food delivery, a great way to support local businesses and avoid crowded stores as long as it's packaged and stored safely, that is. And you need to make sure that that happens long before it ever reaches your doorstep. With tons of grocery services, subscription meal kits, and food delivery apps available to choose from, it's never been easier to have fresh meals delivered to the doorstep. But before you place your next order, check if what you're eating follows federal food safety standards. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommends asking companies you buy from how their food is prepared, handled, and shipped to your home. Try to arrange for deliveries while you're home, but if you can't be there in person, ask for the box to be left in a safe spot outside. When your delivery arrives, check its temperature with a food thermometer. Food services should use insulated packaging like frozen gel packs to keep perishable food cold. Anything above 40 degrees Fahrenheit is not safe to eat. This is especially important for older adults, young children, immunocompromised people, and pregnant women who are more likely to get food poisoning. When in doubt, throw it out. If your food is safe to eat, refrigerate it immediately to keep it from spoiling. Rinse any fruits and vegetables underwater and keep raw meats and seafood separated from other foods. And of course, always wash your hands before enjoying your new freshly prepared meal. And since the start of the pandemic, telemedicine has boomed and virtual visits are in huge demand. Up next, what are your options and how to find a doctor to video chat with? The number of people seeing the doctor over screen time is booming exponentially with concerns about COVID-19 and people still needing to go to the doctor for other reasons. They are turning to telemedicine. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz looks at your options for finding an e-doc. 
It's a dilemma. You want to see a doctor, but you don't want to be near sick people or even spread your germs. You can accomplish a lot of stuff through, you know, through video chatting or even just emailing your physician now. Telemedicine is exploding. Virtual visits are now expected to surpass one billion this year. So if you've never tried to see an e-doc, where do you start? We'll begin with your personal physician. Many are now offering virtual visits. Check with your insurance company. They may offer virtual visits or offer a way for you to get health care in your home. And if you're uninsured? If you have no insurance at all, the walk-in clinics and urgent care clinics can be an affordable way to get care that you need on a given day. Some urgent cares or retail clinics offer video consults for a flat fee. CVS's Minute Clinic, for example, has video visits 24-7 for $59. And more and more private companies are offering virtual care, such as Remedy, based in Austin. So once we go through a patient's symptoms, we want to see, do they presently have a fever? Carbon Health launched in Texas today, offering virtual visits for $49. Many insurance plans are accepted. Telemedicine has limitations, but it can be convenient and useful for a wide range of issues, from allergies to bug bites, and it can be helpful deciding whether you should go to the doctor or ER. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. All right, so we could use some rainfall around here, and I want to start off with the latest aquifer reading. This is important because we're down to 660.8, and we're now about five feet below average for the month of May. And if we stay on this path and don't get rainfall soon, watering restrictions will likely be just around the corner. I mean, we're talking within a week or two, we could have watering restrictions. So let's talk about our rain chances. We do have a slight chance later tonight into early tomorrow. We're giving it a 30%, but then we see those chances elevate a little bit more toward the end of the week and into the weekend. Notice by Saturday, 40% chance. That really seems to be the most promising scenario right now. And with any luck, We'll continually be raising those rain chances in the days and newscasts ahead. So let's talk about it right now. We look at the satellite and radar. Nothing but clouds rolling overhead. Some storms developing over the higher terrain in Mexico, and we should see some development starting soon in West Texas, which we are just east of El Paso there. And that's out ahead of this little ripple in the upper level flow. It's a very faint little upper level disturbance. It's a weak one, but it should be enough to generate some storms in West Texas and even along the border later on tonight. And then some of those could survive if we're lucky to make it to the I-35 corridor. Here's our future cast, and there's really no good consensus on what's going to happen tonight, but it's one of those situations where it's always a toss up with those overnight storms. We watch them, and by midnight, we should have some border storms and even in parts of the hill country. Then we go into the early morning hours tomorrow by 5 a.m. If they hold together, we could get a quick splash of rain with a little bit of lightning and thunder. We're not expecting anything severe around town. Otherwise, once we get into the afternoon tomorrow, our rain chances fall off again and we'll just have uh, mainly cloudy skies. So there's that slight chance tonight and into early morning tomorrow, we give it about a 30% chance. As for the humidity, it's on the rise, which when you need rain, it's a good thing to have around. You know, dew points are rising. We got the wind coming off the Gulf of Mexico. Dew points back to 60, and it's only going to get higher through the night and into tomorrow. So get ready for a muggy stretch with no relief from a cold front within the foreseeable future. It's that time of year. So Rock Springs is at 77. We're 84 in San Antonio. Pleasanton's 85 and Catula at 91. Still pretty pleasant out there. As for this evening, very uneventful, just increasing humidity. And then that storm chance around midnight near Del Rio and locations near the Rio Grande. Then by early tomorrow morning, pre-dawn hours through about 9, 10 a.m., we have that 30% chance here in San Antonio. Otherwise, a little bit of sunshine in the afternoon. Temperatures rise back into the lower 90s by Thursday. High humidity, which means low morning clouds every morning. Every morning, we're going to have those low morning clouds at sunrise, and then the sun breaks out by about... 10 11 a.m. Those rain chances elevate a bit as we get toward the end of the week and especially into the weekend. I'm going to talk more about that in detail coming up at six as well. Ursula and Steve bring on that rain, please. Thank you. You, you know, it was sad when they made the initial announcement. Now that it's official, 
Still sad. The San Antonio Rampage yeah. sold to the team in Las Vegas. They were going to play starting next season. They were hoping to get in the rest of this season to say at least very much so goodbye to their fans from San Antonio. But that is not going to happen after what happened today. We'll let you know the latest on our San Antonio Rampage. And the NBA extends its termination of the collective bargaining agreement. We'll explain what that means when we come back. The Rampage have already played their final game in San Antonio. That's after the American Hockey League Board of Governors voted to cancel the rest of the season due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Rampage were sold. National Hockey League's Golden Knights back in February, so their days in the AT&T Center were already numbered. But with today's vote, the team will not get a chance to say goodbye to their fans before moving on. Last game played in the AT&T Center by the Rampage is on March the 8th and a 3 nothing loss to Milwaukee before the league shut down play on March the 12th due to the coronavirus. Here's a statement released by Frank Maselli, SS&E Vice President. President. Over 18 seasons, we witnessed some great hockey and together created a lot of wonderful memories. It breaks my heart that we can't say thank you and goodbye to our fans in person at the AT&T Center. As a result of today's decision, the Rampage officially in their 2019-2020 season with a 24-25-7-5 record and now become the longest tenured sports franchise not to survive in San Antonio, leaving behind a trail of teams that have moved on or folded, including the Iguanas, the Dragons, the Stars, the Texans, the Gunslingers, the Wings, and most recently the Commanders, to name a few. Refunds for games that were canceled will be processed back to fans' original form of payment within 48 hours and should, according to Spurs Sports and Entertainment officials, reflect in your account three to five business days. Sale of the Rampage was announced on February the 6th, not long after that. In fact, just 10 days ago, it was reported that one or more minority investors in the Spurs franchise were looking to sell their shares, and the team has hired Guggenheim Partners out of Los Angeles to process that sale. It is unclear how many shares would be sold, but there are a number of minority investors in the Spurs organization, with the majority of the shares held by the Holt family. When news of the sale leaked out, Spurs Sports and Entertainment Chairman Peter John Holt issued a statement immediately, saying in part, as ownership group, we remain 100% committed to the city of San Antonio. But given the recent turn of events and the COVID-19 pandemic, you can see why some Spurs fans are uneasy. The NBA and the Players Association have agreed to push back the termination of their collective bargaining agreement for another 60 days until September to get a better picture of the economic fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. When the league suspended play on March the 11th due to the coronavirus outbreak, it triggered the force majeure clause in the CBA that gave the league 60-day window to terminate the agreement. The original 60 days would have ended today, but the extension of allows the league and its players to try and salvage this season this summer before going back to the bargaining table to discuss new salary cap and luxury cap provisions to begin in 2021. So they're going to have to go back to the bargaining table to kind of encompass everything that has happened in this economic meltdown. Yeah, a lot of people are going to have to do that. Exactly. Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back. The humidity is back tomorrow. It's going to be around for the rest of the week and really the foreseeable future. Could have a few storms develop tonight and move through early tomorrow morning. So that's something we'll keep an eye on. Otherwise, we'd have to wait until Friday and into the weekend for a slightly better chance of rain. Thank you so much, Adam. And thank you for watching the News at 5 with us today. World News is up next. We'll see you back here at 6 o'clock.